everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week, so if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about a solved serial killer case, about a serial killer duo actually and their names were John Duffy and David Mulcahy. In the 1980s Duffy and Mulcahy began a reign of terror in the northwest area of London as together they started committing several rapes and as the police started trying to solve the case and catch the perpetrators they became known in the media as the railway rapists. However it wasn't long before the railway rapists also became known as the railway killers, as Duffy and Mulcahy began not only raping their victims, but brutally murdering them too. And yet, even though they committed these horrific crimes together, unbelievably, initially, only one of the two men was actually convicted and sent to jail. The other remained a free man for over a decade. But quickly before we get into the case, I would just like to say a huge thank you to June's Journey for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game set in the beautiful glamour of the 1920s with a diverse cast of characters. And essentially, you are the detective of the game because you play as June Parker who is trying to solve the mystery of who murdered her sister. You will have to pick up different clues as you progress through the game which will slowly help you to start piecing the case together and you'll also be uncovering the many secrets within June's family. And as well as this along the way you can also start fixing and renovating the Parker family's very old and derelict mansion. As you complete more levels you'll earn more stars which which means you'll be able to unlock new decoration items for the mansion. And of course, as well as the mystery aspect of the game, that is one of my favourite parts. I'm finding it so fun and relaxing to decorate the garden around the mansion at the minute. June's Journey is completely free to download and it is available on both iOS and Android mobile devices and also on PC through Facebook mobile games. And for the third year, June's Journey are also participating in the Green Game Jam and they are inviting their players to join the Wildlife Week in the game to support the Himalayas. Starting from today, the 31st of May until the 6th of June, you'll have the chance to collect these new adorable little animal decorations in the time-limited events. And Wugga, the company who created June's Journey, are going to be donating $100,000 to protect the Himalayas if players all together collect 500,000 decorations. And if we all reach this milestone together then every player who collected at least one animal decoration will receive the horn of the Himalayas decoration for free which has never been seen before. So if you want to help protect the Himalayas and raise this money then make sure you participate in the Wildlife Week. Click the link down below in the description box to download June's Journey or alternatively you can scan the QR code that is on the screen. Thank you once again to June's Journey for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to you guys as always for supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. Just before we continue please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the rapes and murders of several young women and it involves heavy themes such as violence towards women, sexual assault, domestic violence and animal torture and animal cruelty. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case we are going back to the 80s in London in England mainly around the northwest area of London is where the crimes we are going to be talking about today occurred. But before we delve into the heinous acts that this killing duo committed, let's start by talking more about the killer's background, starting with John Duffy. So John Francis Duffy was born on the 29th of November 1958 into an Irish Catholic family. He was born in Ireland, however he and his family moved to an area called Kilburn in the northwest of England when he was 
still a very young child so he was raised in London. Both of John's parents were together and to be honest there isn't really much to say about his childhood. He seemed to have a very normal happy upbringing. There's no evidence to suggest that he was ever abused by his parents. Apparently his parents were always very loving and caring towards him so he had a pretty good life as a child. Well he had a good home life. His school life was a different story because sources state that John Duffy was bullied in school. He attended the Haverstock Secondary School in North London and he never really had many friends. A lot of the other kids thought that he was just quite odd and a bit of a loner. Apparently he just really struggled to fit in and so he was picked on. He was bullied by most of the other children. Apart from this one kid, there was one pupil that didn't bully John Duffy and who would actually stick up for John Duffy against his bullies. This kid's name was David Mulcahy. David Mulcahy was born in 1959, also into an Irish Catholic family, although David was born in England and I couldn't really find much information online about David's early life. I don't know what his relationship relationship was like with his parents, whether he had two very loving parents just like John Duffy. However, it's been suggested that as a child, David was always a bit of a daredevil. He would do really silly and also sometimes dangerous things to get a laugh out of people and I guess be the centre of attention. So for example, apparently he used to do things like stand on a railway line and wait for a train to come along and he would remain on the train tracks until literally the last second and then he would dive off the tracks just as the train was passing. He would just do bizarre things like that to almost impress people, make himself look like this badass kid who wasn't afraid of anything. In the year 1970, at the age of 11 years old, he became a student at the Haverstock Secondary School in North London and it was here where he met fellow pupil John Duffy. It appears as though David, like John, was also a bit of a social outcast in school. He was also bullied a little bit by the other kids. I think John was bullied a lot more than David was and so as I mentioned before David kind of began sticking up for John. He became almost like John's protector in a way because John Duffy was always a very small guy. He was very slim, very petite, very short whereas David was much taller. He was muscly so he became like a bit of a bodyguard to John Duffy. He was there for John and John in return was there for him. They didn't really fit in a school but at least they had each other. They were very alike in their sense of humour and their hobbies. So for example one hobby that they both shared was martial arts. They both really liked martial arts and learning about martial arts and yeah they just developed a very very close friendship. However it was a friendship that would ultimately go on to have devastating consequences because another similarity between John Duffy and David Mulcahy was that they both had a very, very dark, sinister side to them, which became obvious right from their very early teenage years. According to a documentary that I watched, in school, David and John would try to touch up a lot of the girls. They would apparently act like they wanted to play Kiss Chase with the girls, which is a game that a lot of kids do play in school or used to play in school. But if you've never heard of it before, Kiss Chase is basically like a game of tag, but instead of running up to someone and tagging them, you would kiss them and then they would become it. They would have to be the chaser. And David and John would play this game with the girls in school, but instead of running up to the girls and kissing them, they would try to touch them and fondle them in other places without their permission. And they were doing this at such a young age. They were already displaying very concerning sexual behaviours when they were barely even teenagers yet. But that wasn't the only thing that the two friends started doing which was cause for alarm. In addition to that, they also began harming and torturing animals together. John and David got enjoyment out of inflicting pain on innocent defenceless animals, even killing them. In fact, on one occasion when they were around 13 years old, this is very disturbing by the way, so just a pre-warning, but when they were around 13 years old, it was reported that the two boys played a game of cricket 
but instead of using a cricket ball, they used a live hedgehog. And of course, the hedgehog died as a result of this. Now, some online sources state that it was just David Mulcahy that did this to the hedgehog. He killed this hedgehog on his own and John Duffy was present and laughing about it with Mulcahy. Whereas other sources state that they both took part in killing the hedgehog. They both played cricket with it together. But nevertheless, I'm sure that this hedgehog wasn't the only animal that they took pleasure in torturing. As I said, it was a sick and twisted interest that they both shared. As well as terrifying animals, the boys also got enjoyment out of terrifying people too. As teenagers, they would go to this big woodland area in London called Hampstead Heath at night time, and they would wear these scary masks, these Halloween masks, and they would just jump out on people, jump out on couples, just trying to scare them as much as possible. They got this address adrenaline rush, this thrill out of just scaring the living daylights out of people. As they got even older, the two boys who were starting to turn into young men, young adults, began committing crimes together. It started off with more, I guess, low-level crimes like petty theft and things like that, and then eventually they started committing burglaries and car theft. They would break into cars and just steal them and drive around in these stolen vehicles. They wouldn't even steal them to sell on. They weren't stealing them for money. They were just doing it because they could and they got enjoyment out of it. It was another thing that was exciting for them. I mean, they didn't need to steal things for money anyway because they both got their own jobs. John Duffy started working as a carpenter and Mulcahy started working as a plumber and also a plaster and decorator, I believe. Both men eventually got married in the late 70s. John married a woman named Margaret. David married a woman named Sandra. They would both go on to become fathers. Duffy and Margaret had one child together, I think, whereas David was a father of four. I mean, on the outside, to everyone else, they both just seemed like two respectable family men, especially David Mulcahy. People that knew him just thought that he was this nice, good guy but that couldn't be farther from the truth. Both David Mulcahy and John Duffy carried that cruel and sinister side of their personalities from their childhoods into their adulthood. However, their reign of terror didn't stop at the torture of animals or terrifying members of the public or committing burglaries and car theft because in the early 80s, Duffy and Mulcahy began committing other, even more violent and sadistic crimes together. They started committing rape. According to one documentary, it all started when Mulcahy developed a very hostile relationship with this one woman that he worked for. As I said, he worked as a plasterer and I think this woman was a customer of his who he'd had some kind of argument or disagreement with and he felt that she needed needed to be taken down a peg or two. And so he told his best friend John Duffy about this woman and together they came up with a plan on how they were going to teach her a lesson. They decided that they were going to rape her. They were going to go to her house, break in. Obviously, David knew where she lived because he had done some work at her house. They were going to break in when she wasn't there and then in the evening when she returned, they would attack her and sexually assault her. So one evening, they put their plan in motion. They went to her house and they waited and waited and waited for her to walk through the door but she never did. Luckily, the woman didn't actually come back home that night for some reason, so their plan had failed. But they didn't want to just give up. They had got excited about the prospect of raping someone, and so they decided to just target someone else, find another woman that they could rape. They broke into another woman's house again with the intent of assaulting her once she returned home. However, once again, it didn't quite go to plan because the woman they intended to attack actually came home that evening with a man and so Duffy and Mulcahy quickly left. And it was then when they realised that this kind of technique was never going to work. There were too many risks involved with breaking into a woman's house and waiting for her to come home. If they kept trying to do it this way, there was a good chance that they would be caught. And so they devised a new technique. Rather than breaking into their victims' homes, they were instead going to go and 
and look for women that they could rape on the street. They were going to drive around in their car looking for victims that they could rape together, like they were hunters looking for their prey. The first rape that the men committed together occurred in October of 1982, when one evening they spotted a 21-year-old girl walking alone along the side of the road in Kilburn in northwest London. She had just attended a party and when she left she started walking back towards her house and in her hands she was carrying a teddy bear and unfortunately during her journey she encountered two strangers who unbeknownst to her were David Mulcahy and John Duffy who both would have been around 24 years old by this point. As soon as the men saw this young woman they went straight up to her and they threatened her with a knife. Apparently they held plasters over her mouth to stop her from screaming and then they took her into the garden of a house nearby. The house was empty at the time. They forced her into a shed in this garden and it's been reported that Duffy said to this girl, quote, don't worry, we only want the teddy bear. But of course that was a lie. They forced the girl to remove all of her clothes. They blindfolded her and then both men raped her. And then once they were done, once both men were satisfied, they just left. The friends had just committed their first rape together, but it wouldn't be their last. Far from it. This was only the beginning. John Duffy and David Mulcahy would go on to rape and assault numerous young women across mainly the northwest area of London. They literally got into a routine where most nights they would be out driving around in the car looking for victims. They would carry weapons with them and items that they would use in the rape. So they would have like masks and balaclavas, duck tape to restrain the victims and blindfold and gag them and sickeningly as they were driving around looking for victims the men would apparently listen to the song Thriller by Michael Jackson. That was their song. This song would hype them up. It would get them even more excited to go out and commit rape which is just so messed up. I mean when you think of the lyrics in Thriller, lyrics like it's close to midnight and something evil is lurking in the dark and no one's gonna save you from the beast about to strike. It's just so disturbing. The men would threaten their victims after they had raped each woman. They would force them to tell them their names and where they lived and they would say that if they went to the police afterwards and reported the rape they would know exactly where to find them and they would kill them. But despite these threats many of the victims would go to the police about their horrific ordeals. So the police were receiving so many reports of rape in northwest London and there seem to be many similarities between each rape case. Many of the victims reported that there were two rapists, two men who were raping women together. Some victims did report that they were only raped by one man but I think the majority said that it was two rapists. Many of the victims gave the same sort of description of the rapist. They described how one of the men was rather short, he was slim, he had fair hair, he was quite scruffy, he had a thick beard. A lot of the victims described how he had these piercing blue eyes, whereas they described the second man as being a lot taller, around like 5 foot 11, he was bigger, he had a darker complexion. They said that he had a mole on his chin. And a lot of the victims also said that out of the two of them, the taller man was a lot more aggressive and violent. It seemed as though he was almost the leader in these rapes. Many victims victims also described how a knife was used in the attacks by the men. They threatened the victims at knife point. And another similarity that the police noticed between these cases was that the majority of the rapes, not all of them, but most of them, seemed to take place near railway stations in northwest London, particularly in and around Hampstead railway stations in northwest London. They were taking place very late at night and it seemed as though the offenders were targeting women 
who had just gotten off a train and were walking alone. So because of all of these similarities, the police started to believe that the attacks were connected, that these rapes were committed by the same two men. They were a raping duo. The mystery of these two rapists quickly hit the headlines. It was all over the news that there were men going around committing several rapes. And because no one knew the names of these two men, they were given the name the Railway Rapist. And as you can imagine, this was an absolutely terrifying time for Londoners, for women who lived in London, particularly the women that lived in the northwest of London. It felt so incredibly unsafe safe, especially because, as I said, they were targeting women near railway stations. So many women were now so scared to get a train anywhere out of fear that they would be raped. But also at the same time, I'm sure many of them didn't have a choice. I'm sure many of them had to travel by train most days to get to work. And I feel like most people in London do just get public transport rather than drive their own car because it's just easier and so accessible. But now women feared getting public transport. They feared going to the railway stations at night because of who could be hanging around. They feared that they would be the next rape victim. And it literally seemed as though new rape cases were being reported every single day almost. In fact, according to sources, there were actually three rapes reported as having happened literally on the same day as each other. And yet the police didn't seem to be close to catching the perpetrators at all. They still had no no idea who the rapists were. All they knew about them were vaguely what they looked like from some of the victims who gave descriptions of their appearances. By late 1985, the investigation into the London rapes was given the name Operation Heart, and the police had started to connect about 24 rape cases in total. They strongly believed that the similarities in these cases suggested that they were committed by the same two men, who at the time, unbeknownst to them were John Duffy and David Mulcahy. By this point, Duffy and Mulcahy had been committing these rapes together for a good few years, for about like three years now, and they hadn't been caught. They were still free men. And so naturally over time, their confidence started to grow. They probably started to believe that the police were never going to catch them. They could keep committing these horrific crimes and there would be no consequences because the police were no closer to finding out the railway rapist's true identities. So Duffy and Mulcahy believed that they could commit any crime and get away with it, even murder, it seems. It was in December of 1985 when John Duffy and David Mulcahy stepped up their reign of terror because the next victim that they chose, they wouldn't just rape, they would also murder. The date was the 29th of December 1985 and that evening a young woman named Alison Day got on a train to Hackney Wick Station in North London as she had plans to meet up with her fiancé at his work. He worked on a trading estate close to Hackney Wick. Just for some extra information about Alison, she was 19 years old at the time that this case occurred. She lived with her adoptive parents in the town of Upminster in East London. She was adopted when she was a baby. She worked as a secretary in a solicitor's office and as I said, she had a fiancé. She was engaged so it was a very exciting time in her life. And yes, on the evening of the 29th of December 1985, Alison planned to meet with her fiancé at his place of work. However, it turns out that she never actually made it there because after getting off her train at Hackney Wick Station that night, she unfortunately encountered the railway rapist, John Duffy and David Mulcahy. Duffy and Mulcahy were at Hackney Wick Station that night, of course, looking for their next victim. And according to sources, it's believed that as Alison Day was walking along the train platform, Platform after having used a telephone box, she accidentally took a wrong turn and started walking towards the local canal. And that's when she was confronted by Duffy and Mulcahy, who had been watching her since she got off the train. The men pulled out a knife and they threatened Alison with it, and they forced her to walk with them across the railway line and under the railway bridge. And it was there where both men raped her. Now, after the rape, the men forced Alison to walk along the left 
edge of the bridge right by the river. It was called the River Lee. And as she was walking, she actually fell into the river. Now, Alison couldn't actually swim. And so she was panicking even more at this point. She was saying to the men, I can't swim, I can't swim. And so apparently John Duffy reached in and he pulled her out of the water. And it was then when Alison saw an opportunity to run. As soon as she was pulled out of the river, she just legged it. She ran as fast as she could away from the men. But of course, the men were not just going to let her go. And it's been reported that David Mulcahy said to his accomplice, John Duffy, quote, get the bitch, John, get her. So Duffy immediately ran after Alison and unfortunately he managed to catch her. And it was then when Mulcahy realised that Alison had heard one of their names. He had shouted John's name when he told John to go after Alison. So if they let her go, she could go to the police. She could tell them that one of the rapists was named John and then the police would be one huge step closer to identifying the railway rapist. David Mulcahy decided that they couldn't let Alison leave. They couldn't leave her alive like their previous rape victims. It was too risky. So he decided that they had to kill her. So once Alison was restrained, Mulcahy tore up the blouse that she was wearing and he fashioned it into a using a stick and then he used this tourniquet to strangle Alison to death and he made John Duffy help him with this so that they both had a part in killing Alison. Alison was begging the men to please spare her to just let her go. She promised that she wouldn't go to the police but the men didn't care and they strangled her until she was dead. After she was dead the men decided to try and drown her body in the canal in the River Lee so they put a load of of rocks and cobbles in her coat pockets hoping that they would pull her down into the water and then they left. They just went back to their normal lives after having committed a brutal murder. When Alison didn't arrive at her fiancé's place of work that evening, he eventually called the police to report her as missing, and the police started looking into the case. They started trying to find Alison Day. They conducted a huge search around Hackney Wick Station. They appealed to the public for information. However, despite their efforts, it would take more than two weeks for her body to actually be found. She was, of course, discovered in the canal in Hackney Wick. She was lying face down in the water and she still had the tourniquet around her neck from where she had been strangled. And it didn't take the police long to connect her murder to the railway rapist. They instantly theorised that she had been murdered by the two men that had been committing these rapes in northwest London because of the fact that she was abducted and killed near a railway station after having gotten off a train late at night. It seemed as though the railway rapists were now the railway killers. And despite the extensive media coverage that Alison's murder received, unfortunately, the case remained unsolved. The police were unable to determine the identity of the killers. And so it wasn't long before before the sadistic murderers struck again. In April of 1986, just four months after Alison Day was killed, John Duffy and David Mulcahy decided that they were going to claim their second murder victim. The date was the 17th of April 1986 and that afternoon a teenage girl named Marcha Tamboza was on her way to the local shop to buy herself some sweets. Marcha had not long turned 15 years old by the spring of 1986. She was Dutch and she lived with her parents in a village called West Horsley in Surrey which is to the south west of Greater London. The 17th of April began just as any other day for Marcha. She had been to school that day and then when school came to an end she headed back home. She was at home for about an hour or so. She had some food and a drink and then she told her mum that she was going to go back out because she wanted to go to the local shop in the village to buy some sweets. Apparently she actually wanted these sweets because the family were due to be going on a holiday to Holland soon so she wanted to buy some sweets to take with her on this trip. So yeah, she told her mum that she was going to cycle on her bike to the shop and her mum 
told her before she left to make sure that she cycled along the main roads through the village to get to the shop rather than cycle along the railway path next to the railway line. She didn't like Marcia going along the railway path on her own because it was very, very quiet and secluded. So she said to Marcia, make sure you go through the village and not along the railway path. And Marcia agreed and she left her home at around 4pm. However, being a teenage girl, Marcia decided to go against her mother and she decided to in fact go along the railway path because it was a shorter route to the shop than along the main roads and she just thought that she would be fine. Of course she didn't think that anything bad would happen to her if she went along this route but tragically she was so very wrong because it was as she was cycling along the railway path when she was stopped by David Mulcahy and John Duffy. Now it turns out that as part of their attempt to abduct their next victim, Duffy and Mulcahy had actually tied some wire, some fishing line between two trees across the railway path so that it would kind of block off the pathway, act as a bit of a barrier so that whoever came across it would have to stop and kind of step over the wire and then that would give Duffy and Mulcahy a few moments to step out in front of them and strike. It was literally like a trap and when Marcia Tamboza came across this fishing wire during her journey to the shop but she obviously had to stop her bike and try to pick it up and carry it over the wire and it was then when she was confronted by Duffy and Mulcahy. The two men forced Marcia into a wooded area near the railway station and it was there where they both raped her. After the rape Mulcahy picked up a rock and using it he hit Marcia around the head until she was unconscious and after she was unconscious David Mulcahy turned to John Duffy and he told him that he was going to have to kill her because Mulcahy said that he had pretty much killed their first victim Alison Day on his own so David Mulcahy thought that it was only fair that John Duffy killed their second victim because then they were even I guess and John agreed so they again made their own kind of tourniquet ligature using Marcher's belt and a stick and using it John Duffy strangled Marcher to death. David Mulcahy praised John Duffy afterwards telling him that he had done a good job and then they just left. They left her body there in the woods and they walked away. Although it's believed that David Mulcahy returned to where Marcia's body lay shortly after and he decided to set her body on fire in an attempt to destroy whatever evidence could have been present on her remains. Mulcahy set her body on fire and he used tissues and twigs to try and get the fire to keep burning. Now of course because Marcia never returned home from the shop her parents were incredibly worried and so they called the police to file a missing persons report and it didn't take long for the police to find her. Marcher's body was discovered the following day in the woods near the railway station and the investigation into her murder that was to follow was given the name Operation Bluebell due to the fact that she was found lying next to some bluebell flowers when her body was found. The detective soon made the connection between Marcher Tamboza's murder and the murder of Alison Day a couple of months earlier, it was strongly believed that they were both killed by the same people. Again, because there were just a lot of similarities between the two cases. Both victims had been raped, both victims had been killed in the same way. They'd both been strangled using an item of their own clothing, which the killers fashioned into a tourniquet. They were both abducted and killed near a railway line. So detectives were pretty certain that Alison and Mark murders were linked and so the investigation became a joint murder inquiry and the hunt was still on to catch those responsible but tragically it seemed as though they wouldn't catch the killers in time to save the next victim because just over a month after March's murder it was reported that another young woman had just suddenly disappeared once again near a railway station. Anne Locke was a 29 year old woman and she worked as a secretary for the London Weekend television network. So she had a very good job, which she enjoyed. She was a very intelligent woman. And she was also married, very recently married, actually. She'd married her husband 
just four weeks before she mysteriously disappeared. The date that Anne Locke went missing was the 18th of May 1986 and that day Anne had been at work and then when she finished work that evening she got on a train from King's Cross Station to Brookmans Park Railway Station in Hertfordshire as that was where she and her husband lived. This was pretty much Anne's everyday routine. She had done this exact train journey I imagine hundreds of times but this particular day was different because Anne never returned home. When Anne was reported as missing and the police started looking into her case, they actually found Anne's bicycle at the Brookmans Park railway station. She would always leave it locked up in the bike shed at the railway station as from the station she would cycle back to her home and the police found Anne's bike at the station. However, it wasn't in the bike shed. It was actually discovered I believe behind the shed. It had just been discarded next to a tree behind the shed, which suggested to the detectives that Anne had made it to Brookmans Park Station and that something must have happened to her literally moments after she fetched her bike. It was like she got to the bike shed, picked up her bike, started walking away with it, and then something happened, which meant that the bike was left abandoned behind the shed. So a big search was conducted in and around the Brookmans Park railway station. They were searching along the railway line, they were searching in the wooded areas and fields and bodies of water around and near the railway line, just looking for any trace of Anne, any indicator as to where she might have gone. In addition to that, the police appealed to the public, urging anyone with any information about Anne's disappearance to come forward. Anne's new husband himself did a very emotional TV appeal in which which he pleaded for his wife's safe return and this case in particular was absolutely huge in the media. The news of Anne's disappearance spread like wildfire. She became known in the media as the missing bride as she had gotten married just weeks before she vanished and tragically as time went by and there was still no sign of Anne, people did naturally start to theorise that she was yet another victim of the railway rapists and railway killers who had been terrorising London for years now and who still had not been caught. About four weeks into the search for Anne Locke, finally there was a development in the case when something was found. It wasn't Anne, but it was some of her belongings. As one of the police officers was searching along a nearby riverbank, they spotted an object sitting in some branches of a tree. It looked like a book or something. So they retrieved this book and it was then when they realised that it was Anne Locke's diary. However, that wasn't all that they found. As they continued searching around this specific area, they also found some more of Anne's belongings, including her address book and her purse. And it was then when I think the police and everyone were just even more convinced that something bad must have happened to Anne. First, her bike is found basically abandoned and now a load of her belongings have been found just ditched near a river bank and it's very unlikely that Anne would have done that herself. Why would she just ditch her own belongings? So unfortunately it was looking extremely likely that if Anne was found she probably wouldn't be alive and tragically eventually this theory was confirmed to be true because nine weeks after Anne went missing her body was discovered. Her body was found by some railway workers on an embankment near the railway line. She was very very badly decomposed by the the time she was found so it was clear that she had been dead probably since the evening that she went missing and of course she had been killed by John Duffy and David Mulcahy who police knew at this point as the railway killers as they still hadn't been identified. It's believed that after spotting Anne Locke getting off of her train at the Brookmans Park railway station on the evening of the 18th of May 1986 the two men followed her as she went to collect her bike from the bike shed and there they threatened her and abducted her. And I did read on one article that a witness did later come forward to the police saying that that evening they remembered seeing a woman matching Anne's description 
at the Brookmans Park station and she was with two men. And the witness said that it looked as though these two men were tugging on the woman's sleeves as if they were trying to pull her away. So it's believed that that woman was Anne and that the two men were Duffy and Mulcahy. After abducting Anne, they took her to a quiet area close to the railway line. They tied her hands behind her back and they raped her. Sources state that Anne's cause of death was believed to have been both strangulation and also suffocation from a gag that had been placed inside of her mouth. I believe it was actually her own sock that was put inside of her mouth and it also appeared as though the killers had tried to burn Anne's body. Specifically, they set the fire around her pubic area in an attempt to destroy evidence of sexual assault. So with Anne Locke, that makes three victims, three murders, all believed to have been committed by the railway murderers who were now officially serial killers. And by this point in the case, so many police officers and detectives were working on the investigation, trying desperately hard to solve it. They had three different police forces all working on this case. The Hertfordshire Police, the Surrey Police, the Metropolitan Police, and also they were working alongside the British Transport Police too. Because of the fact that the killers were clearly using public transport, the railway lines, in and around London to find their victims. And by the time Anne Locke disappeared, the police did have a number of potential people of interest that they were looking at. They had a long, long list of men that they wanted to speak to in relation to this case. And I believe this list was of mainly men that had been arrested before for sexual and violent crimes. But specifically, the police were looking at the violent men on their databases who were also a secretors because you see something that the police knew about one of the rapists and killers by this point was that they were an a secretor an a secretor by the way is someone who secretes blood into their bodily fluids such as their saliva and semen and from dna evidence i believe found on one of the rape victims clothing scientists were able to tell that one of the rapists was an a secretor apparently they actually knew that it was the shorter one of the two men that was the Ace Secretor. I don't know how exactly they were able to get to that conclusion, maybe through one of the rape victim survivors. But yeah, they believe that the shorter man of the duo was the A secretor. So the police were going through their databases looking for violent offenders who were also A secretors. And this is where the net started slowly closing in on the railway killers because John Duffy was one of the names on this list. He was on the list because he was an A secretor and he had been arrested before. He was arrested, I believe, just the year before this in August of 1985 after his wife reported to the police that he had raped her and also just that he was incredibly violent towards her. He physically abused her. And apparently, according to one source, when he was arrested for that, he described how he believed that rape was, quote, just a natural male instinct. He was charged with the rape of his wife, although I don't actually know what his punishment was, whether he was actually convicted in the end. I don't think that he was sent to prison for this, because obviously, as we know, the murder of Alison Day, the first victim, occurred just a couple of months after this in December of 1985. But anyway, that is the reason why John Duffy's name was on this list of men that the police wanted to speak to. He wasn't top of the list though. As I said, it was a big list. There were a good few thousand men on it. And Duffy was around like the 1,500th man on there that they planned to interview. So they were slowly working their way down the list until eventually they did get to Duffy. Duffy was asked to come in for an interview. And interestingly, straight away, as soon as the detective saw him, they did think that he kind of matched the description that previous rape victims had given 
of one of the railway rapists. As we know, victims described one of the attackers as being rather short. He had a lot of hair, thick beard. He had those piercing blue eyes and that was John Duffy. He had all of those features. It was just tick, tick, tick. And he looked incredibly similar to the composite sketch of one of the railway rapists. But it wasn't just his appearance that began to make the police a little bit suspicious of him. Just how he acted in the interview itself was rather strange. According to one documentary I watched, when the detectives interviewed him, they noticed that he was trying to be... I don't even know how to word this, but it was, it was like he was trying to be almost too cooperative with the police. He was trying to be too helpful. So like, I think he was answering questions in just way too much detail and he was trying to be overly friendly, I think. And it just seemed strange. There was something about this man that just struck the police as very odd. But at the same time, I also read in one article that despite the fact that he was trying to be overly helpful in his answers, he actually refused to give over a DNA sample, a blood sample, which was weird. He was acting like he was so, so cooperative one minute and then the next he was refusing to give over his DNA. So the detectives really thought that he may have been one of the two men that they were looking for. He may have been one of the railway attackers. However, unfortunately, they had no real evidence to prove it. They couldn't force him to give over his blood sample because they had no evidence to be able to arrest Duffy and so he was let go. But nevertheless, he was still very much a suspect or a person of interest. However, it wasn't long before the police had another encounter with John Duffy. I believe later on that day in the evening, so just hours after he was interviewed, bizarrely, Duffy actually turned up to the West Hampstead police station himself. He hadn't been asked to come in again. He came in on his own and he was covered in blood. He appeared to have have some injuries on his face. He had a wound on his chest, like a slashed wound, which seemed to have been inflicted with a knife. And he told the police that he had just been mugged by some strangers and that due to some trauma to his head during the attack, he was now suffering with amnesia. And he said that he couldn't remember anything about his life. He couldn't even remember his own family. So following this, John Duffy was actually taken to a psychiatric hospital so that he could be sectioned and treated for amnesia. Now, as I understand it, it is actually believed that John Duffy faked all of this. He faked having amnesia and he lied about having been mugged. It's believed that the injuries he had were self-inflicted so that he could make the mugging story look true. And it's thought that the reason he did all of this was because he knew that if he was admitted to a psychiatric hospital and if he was sectioned, then that would mean that the police were not allowed to interview him. Clearly being called for an interview earlier that day had spooked him. He started to panic thinking that the police were close to catching him and so he faked this whole thing so that he could stay in the hospital and avoid the police. Now the police were not allowed to interview him for a certain period of time due to the fact that he had been admitted. I think it was about two months or something like that so they had to wait until that time was up and then they could question him again. However, from what I can gather, when the police eventually did go to the psychiatric hospital to speak with him again, he was gone. Unbeknownst to them, he wasn't being kept in the hospital involuntarily. He was in a unit where he could essentially come and go as he pleased and he was gone when the police arrived. And it turns out that during the times when he wasn't in the hospital, in the evenings, he was out looking for victims that he could rape. On his own as well, which is actually something that John Duffy did often. If you recall from earlier on in the video, I said that some of the rape victims actually said that they were raped by just one man. Most of them said that it was two, but there were a few victims who were attacked by just one individual. And it's believed that that was John Duffy. As far as we know, David Mulcahy would only ever rape and kill when he was with Duffy. But it was like Duffy couldn't control his twisted sexual urges. And so some nights he would go out and commit rape alone. And that is what he started doing again. He 
raped a 14-year-old girl in a park in the town of Watford in London. However, as it was happening, I believe either the blindfold that he had made her wear actually slipped off of her face or the mask that he was wearing slipped off and she was able to see his face and she later reported what happened to her to the police. Shortly after this, Duffy was spotted stalking a woman in another park, is believed with the intention of raping her, but he was actually caught doing this because as I understand it, by this point in time, he had been put under surveillance by the police. So they had caught him stalking this woman and they decided to arrest him. Following his arrest, the 14-year-old girl that he raped before in Watford was brought into the police station and during an identity parade, she pointed Duffy out straight away as being the man that had assaulted her. So now the police were even more confident that John Duffy was one of the railway rapists and railway killers that they had been looking for. Although he denied it, he basically said no comment to every single question he was asked. He was still trying to claim that he had amnesia, so it was clear that he was not going to tell the police anything anytime soon, and so the search for evidence continued. The police needed stronger evidence to link him to the crimes before they could charge him and take him to trial, and luckily they did find some. Following his arrest, the police conducted a search of his family home, and it was during this search when they found this string, this ball of string. Now this ball of string was called Somyam and apparently Somyam is, or at least it was, a very unique type of string, a very rare kind. I don't think that many had been produced and sold by the manufacturer. Now the police knew that Marcha Tamboza and I believe Alison Day too had been bound with string. During their murders their hands were tied up with string. So they compared the string found on the victims to this ball of string from Duffy's home and it was an exact match. The string that had been used to restrain two of the victims was some yarn. In fact, from what I can gather, the manufacturers of the string were even able to go so far as to say that this string from the victims had definitely come from the ball of string from Duffy's house because they could tell that this ball of string and the string from the victims' bodies had both come from the end of the same yarn. It was the last ball of string that had been produced from this yarn so apparently they were able to match them together so that was a huge piece of evidence for the police really was a breakthrough piece of evidence in addition to that they found a lot of other pieces of I guess more circumstantial evidence but I mean when added all together it was just further proof that he was the killer sources state that they also found a number of knives in Duffy's home knives which I believe match the description of the ones that men of the rape victims had described the attackers threatening them with. They found matches and tissues in his home which seemed to match the tissues and matches that the killers had used to set two of the victims' bodies on fire. They found a lot of very violent pornography in his home. They had evidence from his ex-wife. She was able to tell the police about how violent Duffy could be and how he had raped her before. I even read on one source that his wife told the police Police that one night Duffy returned home and he said to his wife, quote, I raped a girl tonight and it was all your fault. So he had essentially confessed to his wife. They had the evidence that he was an asecretor and as we know, scientists were able to tell from semen evidence collected in, I think, one of the rape cases and from the murder victim's bodies, I believe, that one of the killers was an asecretor. Unfortunately back then, because this was the 80s, they couldn't definitively link the semen evidence to John Duffy due to the fact that DNA testing was in its infancy. But as I said, they could tell that one of the attackers was an A secretor, and that was John Duffy. He pretty much perfectly matched this psychological profile that an expert had previously provided to the police of what the killers would have been like, what their life was like. The expert apparently came up with 17 characteristics of the killer, and Duffy matched 13 of them. So 
for example, they theorised that the killer was married, but that he did not have a happy marriage, which was very true. Duffy and his wife separated because he abused her. They theorised that he was probably a loner with not many friends. Again, very true for Duffy. He didn't have many friends. He'd always struggled to fit in and make friends. They theorised that the killer was into bodybuilding or martial arts because of the way that some victims had been restrained and injured and Duffy was into that. He'd always been fascinated with martial arts. There were so many things that this expert came up with which just matched John Duffy. Some more circumstantial evidence was that John Duffy used the railways in London a lot for work. I even read on one source that he did some work for British Rail at one point so he knew the railway lines well. Evidence against Duffy really was just mounting and mounting and the police eventually felt as though they had enough evidence to charge him. Duffy was ultimately charged with several rapes and all three murders, the murders of Alison Day, Marcia Tamboza and Anne Locke and he was headed to trial. But of course the investigation was far from over for the police. Their job was only half done because they knew from the victims and other evidence that there were two attackers, two killers. So if John Duffy was one of them, then who was the other? Well, it didn't take the police long to identify David Mulcahy as a suspect. They strongly believed that he may have been the second half of this killing duo. He matched the description of the second killer provided by many of the rape victims. He was taller than Duffy, he had a bigger build, he had a mole on his chin, etc, etc. And also they thought that the second killer was Mulcahy because... I mean, in all honesty, Mulcahy was basically Duffy's only friend, the only friend that he ever really had, so the police couldn't find anyone else in Duffy's life that he could have committed these crimes with. He had no one else. But, of course, him being Duffy's only friend is not solid evidence at all. So the police had to find something which actually linked Mulcahy to the rapes and murders too. However, they really, really struggled to do this. Mulcahy was arrested and questioned by the police a number of times. However, he always denied any involvement in the case. The police searched his property and they never really found anything. They did find some items in his vehicle which they thought could have been related to the murders and rapes. So they found like masks and masking tape and stuff like that but of course that's barely circumstantial evidence really let alone solid evidence. Rape victims were unable to pick him out of the identity parades because they were just too traumatised. I think they just couldn't bring themselves to do it understandably. So the police had no evidence against him in terms of witnesses. They tried their hardest to find evidence against David Mulcahy but they just couldn't. They could not find enough to arrest and charge him and so it was looking like if he was the second killer he was going to get away with it. In February of 1988, John Duffy went to trial at the Old Bailey Court for the rapes and murder charges after pleading not guilty. And he was ultimately found guilty of five rapes and two murders, not three, two. Duffy was actually acquitted of Anne Locke's murder because it was felt that there was not sufficient evidence to be able to convict him of her murder. Unfortunately, due to the fact that Anne Locke's body was not found until nine weeks after her death, that meant that there was no forensic or DNA evidence left on her remains to tie back to Duffy. And also, I believe the police's biggest piece of evidence, their strongest evidence against John Duffy was the Somyan string that Alison Day and Marcia Tamboza had been tied up with because of how unique and rare it was. But I don't think any of this string was found on Anne Locke's body. So... Yeah, it was felt that there just was not enough evidence to be able to convict Duffy of her murder, which must have just been absolutely devastating for Anne's family. At the end of his trial, Duffy was sentenced to 30 years in prison, although this was actually later changed to just a whole life tariff by the Home Secretary, so he was never going to be released from prison. He was never going to come up for parole. He was going to be behind bars until the day that he died. But unbelievably, it seemed 
seems as though the same would not be said for his accomplice, David Mulcahy. He was still free. He had committed so many horrific crimes and he had gotten away with it. John Duffy had essentially taken the fall for both of them because not only did the police not find solid evidence to take Mulcahy to trial, but also John Duffy always refused to give up the name of his accomplice. He never implicated David Mulcahy. And it's believed that the reason for this was because the two men had a pact which dated right back to their childhood. They had been best friends since they were kids and they had always agreed that but no matter what happened, they would never turn on the other. They would never rat the other one out. They always had each other's backs. So even when John Duffy went to prison all those years later for the rapes and murders that he and Mulcahy had committed together, even then, he wasn't going to turn on his best friend. He was not going to break the pact. And so John Duffy was sent off to prison and David Mulcahy remained a free man and he went on to live a very, very normal, happy life. He was still married. He was still a father to his four kids. He was very much a family man. He started his own business, this painting and decorating business. He got to have all of these lovely things and opportunities, opportunities that he had cruelly taken away from the three women that he had murdered. He got to enjoy his life despite the trauma that he had caused for so many of his and Duffy's rape victims and he just didn't care. He didn't feel any remorse or guilt. If anything, I bet he felt quite proud of himself, proud of the fact that he had managed to get away with it and escape capture. And it remained that way for a number of years, or at least until the late 90s. So more than a decade after the rapes and murders, when it seemed as though John Duffy finally wanted to talk and tell the truth. During his time behind bars, John Duffy had struggled a lot with mental health issues. He had many, many mental breakdowns. And then in 1997, he began talking to a prison psychologist. Her name was Jenny Cutler. He and Jenny started having regular sessions together. And slowly, John Duffy started to really open up to her. And he started to talk more about the crimes that he had committed, the rapes and murders that he had committed, and he mentioned to Jenny that he didn't commit these crimes alone. He had an accomplice. And so Jenny just said to John something along the lines of, oh, so which prison is your co-defendant in? And John replied saying, well, he isn't in one because he was never caught. And of course, Jenny was stunned. And she said to John, I'm gonna have to let the police know about this. And when she did, the detectives thought, okay, maybe this is it. If John Duffy agrees to finally talk about Mulcahy's involvement, then maybe after all these years, we can finally bring Mulcahy to justice. Now, coincidentally, around this same time, it was looking like there could be another huge development in this case because detectives had been informed that there had recently been a new string of sexual assault and rape attacks in North London, specifically on Hampstead Heath. So there was a rapist on the loose who had not yet been identified. And when the detectives who had worked on this case heard about this, they wondered if maybe the perpetrator could have been David Mulcahy, since many of the railway rapist victims were attacked in and around the Hampstead Heath area too. Perhaps because David Mulcahy had gotten away with the rapes and murders he had committed years ago, he felt confident enough to start attacking again, this time on his own, because obviously John Duffy was behind bars. Now, the police had DNA evidence of the rapist in these recent sexual assault cases, and so David Mulcahy, who at this point in time was around 40 years old, he was asked to come into the police station to be questioned and he was also asked to give over a sample of his DNA so that it could be compared to that of the Hampstead Heath rapist. However, it turns out that the DNA wasn't a match, so David Mulcahy hadn't committed these recent rape attacks and so he was let go and the real rapist was ultimately found in the end and convicted. However, despite this, the detective still had a little glimmer of hope because now 
they had Mulcahy's DNA profile, and so in an attempt to finally, definitively link him to the railway rapes and murders, the police decided to use forensic technology, which had advanced a hell of a lot in the last decade. They were going to use forensic technology to see if they could match Mulcahy's DNA to any of the old evidence from the rapes and murders, evidence which had just been kept in storage all these years, and thankfully, it was this line of inquiry that would ultimately provide the breakthrough that the police desperately needed because in storage the police found some clothing which had been collected following the rapes of two Danish au pairs which happened on Hampstead Heath in July of 1984 and it was believed that they had been attacked by the railway rapists and after they were raped their clothing from that night was collected and kept in storage and so fast forward now to the the late 90s, the police got this clothing evidence back out of storage and they sent it off to the crime lab for testing and they found traces of the attacker's DNA on this clothing. There were two people's DNA on this clothing, the two attackers. When tested, it was found that one lot of this DNA belonged to John Duffy and the other was a match to David Mulcahy. And this was it. This was the breakthrough. This was the concrete evidence that the police needed to prove that David Mulcahy was involved. Finally, after all these years, they could prove that he was in on this with John Duffy. And so he was arrested. David Mulcahy was arrested on the 6th of February, 1999. He was questioned, and as you might expect, once again, he denied it, denied that he was responsible. And so they confronted him with the DNA evidence. They told Mulcahy that they had found his DNA on clothing which proved that he was involved in the rapes of the two Danish girls. And literally as soon as they told Mulcahy this, that they had concrete evidence, he was sick. He literally threw up in a basket in the interview room. It was like his stomach just dropped and he realised that this was it for him. There was no escaping this now. David Mulcahy was charged with numerous rapes and three counts of murder. The murder of Alison Day, Marcia Tamboza and Anne Locke, to which he pleaded not guilty. His trial began in the autumn of the year 2000 and one of the prosecution's biggest pieces of evidence was John Duffy himself, Mulcahy's accomplice. By this point, Duffy had given a detailed confession, which obviously implicated both himself and David Mulcahy. And so when it came to Mulcahy's trial, he was asked to give evidence. He was asked to testify. Now, just as a side note, as a result of Duffy's detailed confession, he was actually charged with numerous more rapes, including the rape of Anne Locke. Unfortunately, due to double jeopardy law, in place at the time because he had already been acquitted of Anne's murder, he could not be tried for it again, but he could be charged with her rape. So that is exactly what they charged him with. Duffy pleaded guilty to all of these additional rape charges and he was given an extra sentence of 12 years in prison. But I mean, of course, ultimately that wasn't going to really make a difference in terms of how long he was going to be in prison anyway, as he had already been handed a whole life tariff. But back to David Mulcahy's court proceedings. So Duffy was asked to come in and testify during Mulcahy's trial, which he did in November of 2000. He talked the jury through how the pair committed their crimes, and apparently he even got emotional when talking about one of the murders at one point. He started crying, whether they were actually real tears or not, who knows. But he gave this evidence, and then at the end of the trial, the jury was were sent off to deliberate and when they returned to the courtroom they announced that their verdict was guilty. They had found David Mulcahy guilty of I believe four rapes in total. There was enough evidence to convict him of four rapes and he was found guilty of all three murders and he was sentenced to life in prison. He got three life sentences and then an extra 24 years for each rape he was convicted of and with that he was sent off to prison which is where both of the railway killers remain to 
this day. And that concludes this case. That is the case of serial killers John Duffy and David Mulcahy. A very, very big case. I'm sure that this video will be quite a long one, so do let me know if you made it all the way to the end. And of course, let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments. I always want to hear what you guys have to say. Also, feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. They can be serial killer cases, solved cases, unsolved cases, you name it. Before I go, I just want to say a quick thank you once again to June's Journey for very kindly sponsoring this video. Remember, you can download the game for free when you click the link in the description box or scan the QR code on the screen. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye.